Hello everyone and welcome back to WA100 Live. My name is Carl Brown, I'm the Head of Content at Assemble Media Group and I'm chairing this session which is called Architectural Innovation, the technology helping architects to design for the future. The built environment, as we know, is facing more challenges than ever before with political uncertainty, rising costs, skills challenges and the climate crisis all potentially posing huge challenges for those of us who design our buildings um, and therefore looking at solutions for design for the future has uh, obviously never been more important and technology has a big role to play. Um, so what we're going to try and do in this session, we're going to discuss some of the technological solutions that the industry is looking at currently and it's how they can help us overcome the challenges we're facing as well as looking to uh, some of the barriers to the implementation of these solutions and how we can overcome them. And the great news is we have a fantastic panel to debate all this today, who I shall now, now introduce. We have Alistair Kell, who's the Chief Information Officer from BDP. We have Alistair Powell uh, from uh, Bryden Wood. And we have Martha Sikari, who's Head of Research and Development at Foster's. Um, each of our panellists will talk for around 10 minutes, which should leave us plenty of time for your questions at the end. Now, to ask a, a question to a member of the panel is, is very straightforward. All you have to do is use the questions box that you should be able to see on the right hand side of your screen. Um, but that's, uh, that's more than enough from me, I think. I'm now going to hand over to our first speaker, who is Alistair Kell, who is the Chief Information Officer from BDP. Alistair, over to you. Morning, everybody. Ho hopefully, you can see my screen. Um, yes. Uh, great. Um, show my screen. There we go. So, hopefully, that's now visible to everybody. Um, great. Well, thanks for inviting me to join you. I, I thought it was really timely. Um, and I thought the topics were were particularly interesting. Um, you know, we're in a we're in a post-pandemic world. There's a, there's a huge amount of change and disruption going on within a, uh, within our industry. And you know, you mentioned inflationary pressures. Well, the the, the real concern I have is that what we're effectively doing is increasing the overheads that, that, that require to run our business. So what we need to do is to find cost-effective solutions, or find efficiency gains um, within the way that we, the way that we work. Um, we're also in this post-pandemic world where, in my view, we are still trying to settle on what the new ways of working are. But one thing is clear to me, uh, we need to be more flexible and adaptable now technology is helping is helping that but it also costs money so it comes back to that point of the, the business being uh, being as effective as it can be and then there's significant changes taking place in legislation we have the climate emergency we have the the the, the push towards uh, net zero but you know, more recently, we've got the Building Safety Act, and potentially the the uh, uh, the Project Protect Duty Act, about to appear, which we all have to have to address. Now, I, I'm firmly of the view that technology can assist within this, and you know, I look back to 2010, 2011. Uh, when the the the, BIM, the UK BIM mandate was first released, and we talk differently now, we act differently now but what the intent of that was some 12 years ago now was lower cost faster delivery lower carbon those were the points 10 years ago that everybody was focusing on five years ago we moved forward but the messages are still the same it's about reuse it's about embodied carbon it's about mmc and dfma and digital twins begin to start to appear and We've made rapid progress over the last 10 years. I'm absolutely clear about that. But we're moving into, in my view, a new phase where new tools are emerging, new skills are required. And we're moving to something that somebody else discussed um, with me recently. It was, it's about digital accuracy. It's not about spreadsheets. It's not about geometry. It's about the whole digital approach to the way that we work. So. 
I felt that this epitomized it and it's about the strategy, the skills and the technology. But you know the way that the way that I see it is that within any business there's a pyramid. There's a pyramid and at the bottom you've got the the the, the solid staff base and then you, it, it this tiers up and up and up and at the very top you have those pushing technology forward. Now this only works with the, the the commitment and a determined approach from the business overall. I mean ironically when I when I found this image, if you look at the very top of the pyramid, that's probably the youngest member of the organization up there driving forward, bringing in new skills, new new enthusiasm, new new um new vigor. But it needs that collective approach. And you know, I argue that you can make that top 1%, 10% more efficient, but that's not what the value is. The value is looking at that base and broadening out the skills of the, of that, that base. And if you make 25% of the business 1% more efficient, you, you've achieved far more than improving that 1% at the top. But it's about skills and it's about knowledge coming together. To, for advancement, you know, it, it, it's it's as important to understand the size of a brick or where a DPC goes as it is to be able to to code and to code and script to bring benefit. They have to work hand hand in glove. Now, BDP's approach, um, we 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 are moving forward. We're a large, complex business, so what we have done is set out to look at what we can achieve in manageable steps across each of our professions. This allows us to understand the staff skills that we would acquire, where investment in technology, in training and support is necessary, how we can then measure and monitor the progress that we're making. But the goal is to be more effective, more efficient, and to bring that generative designer approach to a large part of the way that we work. Um, equally, it's about trying to find efficiency in project delivery. So it's about standardization and it's about fi finding the balance between the technical requirement, the need to be effective and efficient, and also the need to get the, the need to keep creativity within the design process. So th these are just a couple of quick initiatives that begin to demonstrate that. Now, the first, and it ties back to the legislation change and the, the political changes that we're seeing in the way that we work. The, the first is, excitingly enough, focused around fire stopping. Now, probably the least interesting part of what architects do, but we've got to get it right. Legislation is now demanding that this happens. And if you understand the changes that have been taking place, the increasing cost of PI insurance following the, the the Grenfell um, disaster and how that feeds into the impact on businesses and the way we work. This cannot be ignored, cannot be avoided. So we define a simple approach. We, we work with, with suppliers and manufacturers to only have certified details being part of the way that we work. We make these available to, to staff through, through standard content. And then we have scripting and coding that allows us to check and verify what's right, what's wrong. So you can see here the, the green, we know that that's a certified detail that's been tested, validated. And we have a group that reviews this on an annual basis to make sure that, that all, of, all of the guidance that we give to our project teams is accurate. So within that, we get efficiency and delivery. We are more economic with our resources, but we're more determined with our approach. Moving forward into healthcare design, PDP, designs a lot of hospitals. We have a lot of knowledge. The problem is that that knowledge tends to get locked into individuals or in individual projects. Well, we're, we're trying to overcome that now using technology to do that. So this is the simple diagram of what we're trying to achieve where we will take a client's schedule of accommodation, review that against our knowledge, knowledge base to be provided with standard examples to match the, the, the client accommodation and then provide that in, into project teams. Sorry to cut you off, Alistair, but I just yep. want to check you're on the right slide because you're still showing the the cover slide at the moment. Is, is that Ah, correct? 
I've moved forward. I've moved forward whether or not this, the, the, the system has, hold on a second. Can anybody see my screen? Because it, it is moving forward for me. Okay, well, we'll we will try and get that uh, sorted for you. Um, hold on a sec. Yeah. It should be on slide six now, I'm told. It should be, well, uh, no. So I'm right. Is that is that visible? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Healthcare optimization. Yeah. Right. Good. So. Cool. Uh, I'll let you know. Remember to it. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, the, this shows the, the 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 standardized approach, and what we've done is taken um, the knowledge the knowledge that we have, and have developed a bit. 75 standard standard rooms. So uh, the, the the architectural geometry, all of the the, the FF and E, all, all of the M and E structural requirements built in. We then, on the back of that, link it to a, a database of all of this information, and then it bring in um, interior design finishes and all of the knowledge that we've built up. Now, because this is centralized, driven by by data, every project now is provided with the same starting point that we can check and verify and understand where we're deviating from. Uh, that way it gives us a, an efficiency in the way that we work, but a consistency as well. Um, and that then can drive forward for for, for offsite manufacturing construction. So here you see, you know, the, the the typical bathroom pod. But from one of the projects that, that we've completed recently, where we were able to drive offsite manufacture there and get the benefits that that brings. So I'm I'm getting closer to the end now, and coding, scripting, and automation. I think that once we start to get into the discussion, the skills that architects need are changing the tools that architects use are changing as well. So this image here is just looking at a proprietary product that, that, that looks at generative design for, for residential and it also does car parking now. But you can see how you can very quickly run through multiple different options around a range of parameters in a, in a cost effective way. It, it doesn't need, you know, the, the the, the, the technical knowledge that that some that, that some businesses are able to have, but you can quickly generate um, multiple options. Um, this next project, this is the Everton Stadium that uh, BDP Pattern is, is is delivering at the moment. And what I wanted to show was the the benefit of taking coding and scripting further forward than an, than a single um, a single use case. So this is. The, the range of scripting that is used at the moment, but that it drives different aspects of design. So the core geometry setting out feeds into potentially glazing balcony soffits, multiple different options around different use cases, and then exported into the, into the delivery tool. Um, and here you can see what that can do. It's about that standardized approach. It's about having half a dozen different panel types as opposed to multiple panel types, looking at how that then relates back to primary structure, secondary structure fixing, all to give benefit, but all being used for construction now. So getting close to the end, I wanted to touch on a couple of future technologies that we are seeing appear over the horizon and begin to understand whether or not there's benefit with them. I think that you need to look far ahead. You need to see what's coming. And architecture is, for the most part, slow to adopt. Um, I think there's multiple reasons for that, but slow to adopt. So the first one was mid-journey. Um, this, this is an AI image generator. So what you can see here are three potential stadiums, not auditoria. These haven't been designed. These have been described. And the, the AI tool generates imagery based on text. Uh, it's a fascinating thing. 
the benefit of it, we can we we'll wait, wait and see, but beginning to see how AI is starting to take hold um, for, for 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 architects is, is is interesting. The other one is a bit more left field. Um, BDP is part of a group of companies that Kisha Kurakawa Architects are also part of. Uh, Kurakawa Architects way back when um, designed the, the iconic capsule tower, which is being demolished now. B BDP was approached by Kurakawa and asked if we would be able to do um, uh, 3D representations of the of the building. Um, the reason for this was that they wanted to sell the individual capsules and potentially the um, the the, the overall building itself as NFTs for use in the metaverse. Now, that's got que questions around the benefit that that actually has. But what was really intriguing for me was that you were taking an iconic building and attempting to find a, an, an additional lifespan for it, albeit virtually rather than rather than in reality. So we, we produced the models, passed them over, and the I think the sale is ongoing. So my final two points are we cannot forget, we cannot forget that technology is an enabler. And currently there are, it is extremely difficult to use technology to drive construction particularly in, in, in the UK. And, you know, we, we are still reliant on people turning up to, you know, a muddy site and, and building. Um, but we can assist that. We can assist our businesses to be more effective and efficient in the way that we work. And we can, we can assist our, our client contractors and end user contractors through through greater uh, greater use of technology. And my final point was the image I showed at the very start. This is a mid-journey image. I took the 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 the, the, the strap line for, for for this discussion, and I fe I fed in the words inflationary pressures, political and economic uncertainty, and cl and climate crisis. And this is what it gave me back. A little bit dystopian, but it begins to show where things are starting to move. So with that, I will I will pass over back to Carl. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I thought that was a really interesting, uh, uh, really interesting thoughts there on some of the cost-effective solutions in a post-pandemic world and a glimpse into the future at the end there. And hopefully, uh, hopefully it doesn't turn out to be too, uh, too dystopian, but um, we're now going to move uh, move on to our next speaker, who's also confusingly called Alistair. Um, it's Alistair Powell, who's the director at Brydenwood. Alistair, over to you. Thank you. Um, just want to check um, that you can see my screen and that you can see the, the slides moving, uh, just to avoid the issues from the last presentation. Is, th is this working OK? It, it appears to be working now, Alistair. We'll, uh, we'll let you know if, uh, if it stops. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to talk. Uh, my name is Alistair Powell. I'm a director at Bride and Wood. Uh, we are a technology company working within the construction sector. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the Repowering Coal platform, uh, building a digital platform to cut global carbon emissions by a third. Um, slightly different presentation. So this is really a, a kind of a, really about a single project, um, but really it's about the the kind of the themes of this webinar, these big challenges that we have in the world, um, and um, how maybe as designers we need to work differently, expand our scope, uh, and also use technology to address these these big challenges. So a little bit of context, we've got, we've got these, big, these big issues in the world, we've got a growing population, we've got growing consumption, there are big demographic changes, aging population, of course there's climate change, et cetera. I think <clears throat> this can all kind of be summarized as there's a lot that we really need to, to do, a lot to be built, uh, but at the same time we've got these supply chain issues, there are issues with um, lack of skills, lack of, lack of um, decreasing workforce, uh, and also uh, dwindling productivity. 
Um, so really, we need to start finding ways of working uh, much, much more productively if we're going to solve some of these really big uh, issues. Uh, the particular challenge that we're looking at on this project is uh, climate change. Um, we need to cut carbon emissions uh, significantly, very, very quickly. Um, the global coal fleet is a major contributor to global carbon emissions, about a third. Um, but these coal plants, they're, they're very valuable assets. There's huge stranded costs in these assets um, and they can't really be ignored from a clean energy uh, transition. So the solution that we're looking at is um, basically reusing these, these sites, reusing all of this infrastructure, uh, but decarbonizing them um, by replacing the coal-fired boilers with small modular reactors. But we need to do a lot very, very quickly. Um, we need to be basically um, repowering um, <clears throat> about 250 to 300 units uh, per year, which is many, many multiples more than what's uh, basically achievable at the moment. Um, the way that we're going to do this is we're building a, a platform. Um, a platform is basically a, 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 a method or a model for uh, facilitating exchanges between uh, multiple groups, um, typically producers and consumers. Um, a, a great example would be Airbnb. So rather than Airbnb going out and buying lots of hotels and then selling rooms to, to guests, what they did is they created a digital platform that linked guests with hosts. Um, so what they really were doing was uh, really unlocking the, the sort of the power of the internet, power of networks. Um, and really platforms are a way of, of, of creating massive uh, impact in the world. And it's really a growing trend in construction. Lots of startups uh, kind of um, interested in, in, this, in this approach. Um, and also the UK government as well, and I won't go into too much detail here, but the government is uh, increasingly moving towards um, uh, platforms effectively being part of policy for delivering uh, UK uh, government infrastructure. Um, so what do nuclear projects look like at the moment? So what we have is um, basically these very bespoke, very complex built projects, built systems. Uh, and what that means is all the project processes are very complicated, uh, time consuming, unpredictable, uh, consume huge amounts of resources. And that really means that we have <clears throat> very few producers that can really kind of manage, um, very few suppliers, sorry, that can really manage all of this complexity and risk. And that makes the project very expensive, very slow. Uh, and really there are few customers that really want to, to really do these projects. What we're looking at doing is um, really trying to standardize all the built systems, uh, make them much more simple, much more uh, standardized, so that all the processes on the project as well are much more standardized, much more predictable, much quicker, with the goal really of building this platform where all of the uh, suppliers and all of the customers that are involved in a project can basically interact much more uh, easily um, and achieve effectively a lot more um, with a goal of basically uh, significantly, uh, significantly reducing the, the cost of the projects, making them much more quick uh, to, to deliver uh, and much uh, less risky. Um, so sort of starting at that bottom layer, what are we doing? So we're looking at reusing uh, most of the, the existing coal plant, uh, which has massive um, capex savings. Uh, then we're looking at standardizing the uh, small modular reactor systems. So these are small modular nuclear reactors. Um, and we're working with a, a range of um, reactor vendors to do this. We're also looking at standardizing uh, the, the building components um, and a number of, a number of other um, kind of innovations. But really what we're trying to do is really standardize um, all of these kind of these these built elements uh, across all the different projects that need to be uh, delivered. So this would be a typical uh, project. Um, this this is a site from the US, uh, two um, 600 megawatt uh, um, coal boilers. Um, those effectively would be turned off. Everything else on the site would be reused. Um, so not just the sort of the physical side of things, but also the jobs, the, the permits, um, the communities, etc. 
Uh, and then what we are doing is uh, basically adding what we call a nuclear island, which has these um, eight, uh, in this case, eight uh, 140 megawatt uh, nuclear reactors. Um, just skipping ahead here. So we also have what we call a heat transfer and storage system. So this is basically just an interface between the coal plant and the, the new reactors. Um, and then skipping ahead here, these uh, these buildings here that are highlighted are basically housing all of the uh, what we call non-safety related systems. So basically all of the, the systems that aren't uh, critical in terms of nuclear safety or environmental safety. Uh, and all these buildings can basically be um, commercial grades, so basically sheds effectively housing all of these systems. And then here we have the, the nuclear grade buildings, which is really the sort of the focus. This is where a huge amount of uh, cost uh, and uh, program traditionally is uh, tied up. These buildings, so this is just a cross section through one of them. Um, these buildings are uh, basically mounted on what's called a seismic isolation system. So this effectively is a standard uh, foundation that can be used anywhere in the world, uh, depending on um, anywhere in the world, irrespective of the seismic conditions of, of that location. Uh, and really what that does is that means that everything above that can then also be standardized. So we don't need to design these buildings uh, individually for every different seismic condition. All of the, um, the, the, sort of the, the, the uh, small modular reactor systems that go within that building these will all be standardized as well. Uh, and these will be um, typically in, in skids or in, in kind of frames um, built off site in factories and then delivered and then effectively plugged in on site. Um, we also have a, a fairly standardized uh, cross section as well. And this cross section can accommodate a wide range of uh, small modular reactor types. And if we need to increase the size of this building, we just effectively add additional sections to the building. And what that means is that all of the components which are being used to basically put this together are, um, there's, there's a basically a small number of components that are required. Um, and because of that, that means that those components can be basically mass produced um, and uh, mass produced in uh, an industrialized supply chain built in factories effectively and delivered to site. Because we've basically standardized all of these, these components, that means that we can now really simplify and standardize all of the, the processes in a project as well. So we can standardize the, the feasibility uh, uh, and early design stages. Um, and we're currently building uh, tools at the moment that will allow customers and investors to quickly understand the, the costs of a project, the, the business case of a project, whether that project can fit on their site, et cetera. We can also uh, standardize and automate the design, design tools, so really accelerate the design process uh, and allow a much wider range of designers as well to uh, design these projects. We can standardize the construction process, so really harnessing the uh, DFMA type approach. Uh, and we can also standardize the, the operational uh, side of things as well. And because we've basically standardized all these built components and we've standardized all these processes, that means we can now really um, simplify all of the interactions required between all of the different um, suppliers and consumers on a project. Um, and really basically enable them to achieve a lot, a lot more than they would traditionally. Um, so really allowing the, the customers to quickly understand the business case for a project, uh, allowing the regulators to approve much more projects much more quickly, uh, allowing designers and vendors um, to basically do a lot more, to be able to deliver a lot more, um, allowing assemblers to be able to assemble more quickly, providing them the tools that they need to uh, program a project uh, much more efficiently um, and other tools effectively as well for other suppliers involved in a in a typical project uh, and really this is really the goal of the repairing coal platform so really trying to standardize the built systems 
so that the processes can be much more simplified, allowing everybody to basically work together uh, much more efficiently. Um, Hi, Alan. Yeah. You, uh, oh, it looks like you're, you're rounding it off anyway. So it's, uh, can I ask yes, you to... it's, just, it's my last slide. So just, just a kind of a point here that this is part of a much wider initiative um, with lots of different partners uh, involved. Thank you very much, Alistair. I thought that was really good uh, on some uh, specific application technology there to drive decarbonisation. And I'm sure there's lots of learning there for other applications as well. Um, I'm now going to move on to our final speaker, who is Martha Sikari, Head of Applied Research and Development at Foster and Partners. Uh, Martha, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me verify that you can all see my screen. Um, is this visible to everybody? Looks okay to me, Martha. Great, thank you so very much, thank you. Um, so, uh, just to... Let me put this down. Um, so, thank you very much for having us here today. Uh, Martha Tegel, I'm a senior partner and head of the applied R&D at Forster and Partners. And I would like to talk to you a little bit about technology and how we have been using it at Foster and Partners. Um, as, as you may know, at Foster and Partners, nothing is as constant as change. And that's what made us look at technology, not as a challenge, but as a possibility. So I would like to talk to you a little bit uh, today about how technology allows us to make possibilities become realities. Um, let me move this. So I'm uh, the head of the Applied R&D group. This is a group that has uh, different people with backgrounds with architecture and engineering, but all of us are programmers. And we have a wide remit of uh, the things that we are actually doing um, within, the, uh, within the group from complex geometry to Internet of Things and machine learning. So I will take you step by step through some of these things and tell you what technology had um, helped us do. Uh, it's interesting to say that technology is not a new thing for us. We have been using it for many years. Uh, Swiss Re was made more than 15 years ago using Excel spreadsheets that actually took a parametric definition and recreated it within our CAD software. That meant that 15 years later, when we were designing uh, things like uh, Mexico City Airport, technology was an increasing part of the process where everything was programmatically created to uh, develop this performance-driven design shell. So talking about performance-driven design, there are a lot of applications that we have been building to allow people to effectively, as they design, analyze their options. That's important for us to make the right decisions early on in the design process. So this is an application that's more than 12 years old now, where effectively we're allowing people in real time to move a physical model, capturing it, creating the digital model as the design goes forward, and then analyzing an array of criteria. And that is important for people to actually be able to understand how well the options that they develop work. Uh, as technology evolves, the tools that we create evolve as well. So nowadays we have been using game engines, for example, and using different media from touchscreens to VR and AR to recreate the same applications and develop tools like Thalia that effectively allows us to design things in real time with all the stakeholders. And as the design evolves to be able to calculate areas, but also analyze the buildings for different criteria like daylight, views, sunlight, CFD. But even more importantly nowadays, to analyze real time soft criteria like well-being factors or CO2 emissions and even financial gains for every single solution. To do these things, we have to develop technologies that are very, very fast as we're going for real time. So Cyclops is one of the tools that has been, uh, has been something we have developing for over uh, a decade. When we started with Cyclops, we could effectively recreate 24 views for every single building within a minute and understand how balls in stadia work or how good the views of a tower could be. Nowadays, we are able to actually do that much, much faster. Cyclops is using uh, GPU computing to allow us to run 600,000 views in less than a minute. So you can see that this technology is ramping up and allows us to do things in real time that we, we, we couldn't do before. Scaling up and distributed computing is part of this idea of uh, going uh, with things bigger and better and faster. Uh, if we take, for example, the UA Pavilion, 
in the UAE pavilion, we run a lot of optimizations using genetic algorithms where we were trying to effectively understand what is the maximum number of differentiation that we have with the minimum number of panels to drop down the price. So we have these two conflicting criteria and we try to work against each other. But what happens when you need to scale that on a city level? So with Hydra, we effectively took into consideration this idea of an entire analysis ecosystem that we have developed with this very fast analysis that I just described, and then effectively try to see how we can apply it on a city scale problem. For the Quanguin Transport Hub, we were trying to develop an entire cityscape around the station, and our objectives were different. We started from saying that we require very good daylight for the apartments, we require very good connectivity, and special connectivity in particular, and proximity uh, to the station. So we had the area, the daylight potential, the connectivity and the views, and we could start creating different options and analyze them, and that could take us months to do and deliver. But what we've done was to allow the computer to do the heavy lifting for us. So we fed all our considerations around these objectives to a generative program, which created thousands of options, compared them and beat them against each other and start breeding the best of them in order to recreate an array of options that we knew were great for the objectives that we had set. Now, this is then becoming not the end point of this journey, but the start point. So this technology allows our designers to have a pool of options from which they can start and they can try to understand what works better for them and how the massing can be recreated in order to hit the objectives they want. Um, talking about new technologies, a lot of people talk about machine learning nowadays and how it can be used directly uh, within uh, the AC industry. That's a very interesting kind of challenge. We have been dealing with a challenge for some time now, looking into different ways to integrate machine learning within our processes at Foster and Partners, uh, from surrogate models to natural language pro processing models and everything in between. We have been finding different ways of using technologies directly within that pipeline that we have. So for example, we're doing surrogate models and with surrogate models, the idea is that you know the analysis of uh, that you're going to get from a particular element, but that analysis takes a lot of time to run. So rather than actually running this analysis ourselves, what we're doing is that we're training a system to understand how well a, a building would perform in relation to that analysis. In this case, we were training a system against special connectivity, which is very heavy duty. And on the left-hand side, you see the actual analysis output. And in the middle, you were seeing the model as it was being trained and the difference, which meant that when that finished, we were able to develop applications like this, directly within Rhino in this case, where our designers can start creating different spaces, click the button and get a prediction of what that special connectivity or even visual connectivity would be within that space in real time rather than having to set any model, knowing that the, the analysis that we, they get as a prediction is 98% close to the actual analysis they would get were they to set up the entire analysis themselves and run it. We have been using quite a lot of things around natural language processing in terms of democratizing the knowledge within the office, creating our own uh, search uh, engines within the office and trying to ask natural questions like, what is the best acoustic insulation and getting back actual answers with the file that comes from our data set. Um, we have been using uh, different models like Midjourney to be able to not necessarily create architecture, but create composites where in this case, the backdrop of this image is something that is derived from this diffusion model, while the foreground is something that our architects have created. But diffusion models have, can also be created and used as design assist. So we are now developing applications like this one, where on the left-hand side, uh, you can see a Rhino view where the designer can start recreating a model as they want it. And as they rotate it, a diffusion model of the background will give different options of what that model could look like, again, as something that can expand uh, their creativity and what they can think. Uh, in terms of extended reality, we have been looking into these things for many years. 20 years ago, the headsets would cost 100,000 pounds. Nowadays, we do this with far less. 
and we can create applications like Glaucon where effectively people can be on the same site at the same time, understanding how a digital mock-up will work as they walk around the site, doing that not just with headsets and backpacks, but also with iPads, and more importantly, allowing for full-time and real-time collaboration from wherever they are in the world for whatever project they need to investigate in with and, and with different media. Um, interoperability is another interesting thing uh, that technology has helped us do. Um, Dogpatch, for example, has been directly been delivered from a quick and dirt parametric model to a full-blown BIM model directly by using technologies like Rhino Inside or we have uh, been in investigating how we can in real time ourselves be able to connect different people and different disciplines together in order to deliver against particular uh, projects. So uh, our interoperability software Hermes has helped projects like the Lucille Towers to be done in real time along these different disciplines. And it was interesting because as we were doing the tower with uh, Lucille, we had the design change very, very close to a deadline that effectively dropped the tower by 10 floors. That meant not that just you chopping 10 floors, but the entire structure needs to be recreated. All the cladding needs to be recreated. Uh, everything around the environmental analysis needs to be recalculated and feedback to the design. But because we had that software that connected everything else together, all these changes were recreated and applied in real time to each discipline's model that allowed us for us to take into consideration and deliver based on that change literally a week before the deadline happened. And, and finally, uh, I would like to bring your attention to digital twin. Everybody talks about digital twins. I don't think many people understand what a digital twin is, which is effectively a replication of a digital replication of, of a real model in space. Uh, digital twins are very interesting for us because it's all about how a building operates and how you can learn from that building, not just to make the building better, but to feed back to other buildings as well. Uh, in true foster and partners form, we've start by eating our own dog food. So we have created a digital twin for our own uh, campus with an application that runs in real time where all the people in the office can actually get information around the campus. And with a, a model that can help you do things like heat maps and sensor data, wayfinding, and anything in between to understand how serious data can be visualized within different digital models and also be applied in the way that we are operating these buildings long term. Uh, to do things like that, we had to scan our models, and this is one of the uh, our office. This is one of the scans of our office as we created them with this little robot here, uh, Boston Dynamics Spot, uh, which we actually start using for our digital twin, but to also investigate uh, the difference between as designed versus as built models. Doing that in our battery power station development, and. It is just to say that there are a lot of technologies like this that are disruptive technologies that can make a big change in what we do. And most importantly, can help us deal with the data that we produce uh, within the AAC space. So the ASPC space creates, collects, shares, and can learn from a huge amount of data. And I think technology will help us use this data as a driver long-term. Uh, both in design and construction, but more particularly during operation, creating that data cycle that can help us design and operate our buildings better. And uh, that was me. Thank you very much, Martha. There's um, ran through um, uh, a lot of stuff there. There's a whistle stop and tour of lots, lots of solutions, which I thought was great. Um, if I can invite the other panelists to um, switch their cameras back on we can now go into the q a uh, we've had we've got several questions from the audience um, and i want to ask some questions as as well um before we go go before we go to the audience questions i would just like to ask a question about um skills um we you know we we, we keep hearing about a skills uh, crisis in the uk and in the built environment um so i just wondered what what the panel thinks about the current um, situation of, uh, regarding skills and technology in architecture. What skills do architects need to develop, and, and you know how do how do we fill how do we fill the gaps? Basically, um, I don't know who wants to take that one 
I'm, I'm, I'm happy to happy to take this. Um, I mean, it, it's a very good question, and I think that the answer is 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 not simple, but it's clear that understanding how you manage data, understanding how you, how you the benefits of querying and scripting within the overall suite of skills that an architect ha needs is is absolutely vital now um you know i i i always tell the story i'm giving my age away i i was the my year at architecture school was the last year that I was able to graduate without producing a cad drawing so <laughs> um you know it it, it 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 cad wasn't a requirement in the in the late 80s it became it became the the prerequisite through through the 90s and the early 2000s and then BIM took over and where we are now it's about understanding how you can manipulate data it's all, almost you know needing to have you know the skills of a data scientist the skills of a software engineer and the the creative processes and thought okay. processes that architectural education gives us so, so would um, uh, Martha and the other Alice, would, would you agree with that assessment that it's, it's more about almost like data science skills that are needed in the industry now? I think, uh, I mean, look, we, uh, my team is basically full of uh, developers and a lot of that work can happen from developers. Is that a prerequisite? I would say no. I would say the prerequisite is to be able to go outside your comfort zone. Because the entire idea with technology is that it helps us become better, faster, and enhance our creativity. So even somebody who just does things uh, by drawing or somebody who's on site and only understands construction, it's not a matter about these people having best technology skills. It's about them adapting them within their pipeline, understanding what they can do, and not go and say, well, you know what? this is not for me because I haven't done this and I don't understand this, so I will push this aside. This is about them saying, okay, what are the disruptive technologies out there? How inclined are we to incorporate them within our process? And there are different skills for different people. Uh, a manager is not necessarily expected to know how to program, right? Uh, but, uh, well, if I didn't know how to program, my team would kick me out <laughs> anyway. But effectively, a manager like on a, on, on a, partners, a partnership level might say, well, I don't know how to program but I know how to take these right people and engage them in the right way within the process to deliver something uh, that is better than it was before. Okay. Is think, there uh, maybe not in terms of which specific skills that we need to, to develop, but the, the fact that we'll be forced to develop those skills. Um, the, the rate of change in technology, uh, I mean, in probably everybody's seen in the news all the different artificial intelligence applications that are being launched. Um, and the fact that we're going to have to, there's, there's basically these, these massive challenges in the world that will require new ways of working, adoption of technology, et cetera. Um, I guess the point is that we'll, we will have to develop new skills. Uh, we'll, we'll basically be forced to. Um, and it will probably push everybody outside of their comfort zone, but it will be something that will be necessary in terms of, you know, surviving the basically as a profession. Um, yeah, I think that's something to, to be mindful of. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, can see, I can see some, um, thanks for that, Alistair. We've got some questions coming through. Um, one of them is, is for Alistair uh, from Bridingwood. Um, he says, do you have advice on how the standardization principles you have discussed can be applied to other practices working on different large programs of work? <clears throat> okay, um, that's a tricky question. Um, I, I guess it's hard to answer that without maybe a bit more specific, but I guess a starting point would be um, the various documents that the UK government have, have, or partners to the UK government have been publishing on, on um, basically standardization as well as uh, DFMA platform approach to DFMA. I, I would imagine that that would be a really good starting point because I think what you're seeing is the UK government are trying to 
create these rules, create these principles um, so that everybody can start to follow them, so that everybody knows that the thing that they're sort of developing will tie into the thing that somebody else is developing, trying to almost create an, an industry effectively. Um, I think without knowing more specific information, that would be probably the, the best starting point is basically to look at these, these standards and guidelines that are being developed. Would, would, would anybody um, appreciate, it's slightly vague, but would anybody else on the panel have any thoughts on how standardisation could, or what to take into account? I, 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 I'll i offer a little bit of my view, because we've had some, some experience on other programmes. I think that the programme itself needs to have the desire and, and understand the implications of progressing a, stand, a standardised approach around that individual programme. There's effort, commitment and investment needed to basically build that approach that, that's then going to be implemented. And I, I think that the, you know, the, 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 the govern, government initiatives signpost all the steps that, that should be followed, but it, it really needs the leadership um, and the, the the particular strategy needs to be developed at a program level to get to get the full benefit. I think the individual companies within a program can very probably get some gain for themselves. But the I think the real benefit is when it's a it's a fully you know there's a fully embraced strategy that moves from design through procurement, manufacture, construction, operation. It, it's its the totality of it all. And that's the thing that certainly I've seen as the hardest part to get right since the BIM mandate was launched. You know, individual disciplines or individual points along the, the, the journey can, you can get benefit, but you know, it, it's how how the architect at, at the very beginning with a concept is uh, is going to be supported to make sure that three years after the building's in operation, the 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 processes are still being followed. Okay, um, let, let's let's move on. Um, we there's been a few questions from the audience which are kind of which I'm going to try and wrap into one question. I, I suppose it's kind of uh, questions about barriers to the wider um, take up of technological solutions in architecture. So, um, you know, why is it that, that some architectural firms um, like you guys are, are seem to be more advanced than other architectural firms? And and what are the barriers? Is, is, it, is it to do with cost? Is it a zone thing? We've already talked about skills. What, what, what do you think, um, what do you think is preventing technological solutions um, being adopted more widely in the profession. And that's for anyone who fancies it. I think they, there is a lot of... Um, the, the industry, uh, as Alistair said, is very difficult to change. The AC industry is slow moving because there are so many moving parts into it. Uh, I think a lot of the things that, um, that have to do with technology require a lot of R&D to happen and R&D is challenging because R&D is not necessarily something that has a positive effect always. You will try a hundred things and if one of the hundred thing act things actually works, then you're happy, that's a success, but you have to have the 99 failures before. And I think very few companies are willing to invest on the 99 failures for the one success. So you become a cost center effectively as an R&D uh, group, right? But that's a cost center that the company needs to have the foresight to understand that long term is going to yield very good results and put you ahead of the curve. And so it becomes an administrative decision. It becomes a decision that comes from the top down and also becomes something that needs to be facilitated bottom up. Because I feel in many situations you have a lot of good people trying to do good things. Obviously, these things have a an interesting development. You start very, very slowly doing things with no much uh, kind of um, production or something to show for it, and suddenly it explodes. And most people are really kind of tired by that point, and they say, okay, we, we shouldn't be doing this, uh, we shouldn't be spending time and money to do this, you need to just develop on, on what, what you do. So there is, a, there is a place as well from bottom, uh, bottom up to try to showcase what the um, 
what the company can take out of what, what you're doing. Um, and at the end of the day, it's also a resourcing issue, right? For a lot of these things, you need resources, you need the right people, uh, you need the right technology, and all these things are not necessarily things that are easy to acquire. And so that dedication to innovation is something that needs to permeate all these decisions and help you persevere rather than kind of be inclined to stop you from doing so. And I would say that's what I find are the main, uh, the main issues why this is, these things are not more uh, globally adopted. I think there's, um, there's also uh, an issue around the, the sort of the, the risk that uh, is kind of inherent to construction. Um, you, only one small detail on a project can have huge ramifications in terms of you know cost and program. There's a huge number of you know lots of businesses go bust over over you know things like that, and um, so there's a huge risk in innovating actually. You, it, and I think that's sometimes overlooked. Um, maybe in other sectors, more like you know more like um, let's say web development, for example, you can kind of sandbox something that's perhaps much lower lower stakes, but in construction, um, if you um, start in, uh, uh, start basically playing with different types of technology, whether it's robotics or, or um, software, et cetera, um, there's a huge amount that can go wrong. And I think, I think that innovation risk is something that's maybe overlooked sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, the one point I would add to that, I think Martha um, kind of summarised it quite well. Where we are, and you know, the, the, the strap line for the webinar, there's a huge amount of change and there's, a, there's fundamental pressures on, on every business. And the, the ability to, to, to find money, to invest in R&D, is something that I think our three firms we're lucky enough to be in a position to be of a scale that we can do this. Many others just, you know, it's a very hard market out there, and they simply don't have the the the, the finances, you know, year in year out to be able to to make investment. It's interesting that you say that, Alistair, because we've we've just had uh, we've just had several questions about smaller practices pop through from the audience, so. Um, I'm paraphrasing some of these, but somebody is saying, um, you know, um, for small practices, what would you suggest would be the best area of technology to invest in? Um, well, I mean, you, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. What's your advice for smaller practices who don't have the facilities or skill sets that, that the larger guys have? So well, there's a couple I, of questions there. Yeah, I, I think find find a way of demonstrating benefit quickly because the the longer you you progress and the more complex your solutions are the harder it is to show that benefit and you know i'm, I'm surprised that there are many practices that still don't appear to have properly uh, adopted bim now that was hard for us way back when it was hard but you could very quickly show benefit into the business you, you could be a bit more effective visualization became easier vr came along as an output so all of a sudden you've got all of this free stuff that comes along with just adopting that technology now you push and push and push the more you push the harder it gets the more expensive it gets but look at what it, what the baseline is look at what people are doing look at the proprietary tools that are out there and understand how if you cannot be more efficient you can at least reduce risk in what you're doing and you know there's, pl there's plenty of case studies it, it, the problem is it is a leap of faith and the hardest part is turning up to somebody that doesn't necessarily understand or believe in the technology and say right okay we want you to deliver this building to the same program um, with the same internal resource and you're still going to make a profit at it and just believe me that it's going to work. Get on with it. And that's a really hard thing to do. To, to, to do. It's a really hard ask. I, th I think it's just a, a matter of... Step, but Alistair, it's a matter of like people not like... I think particularly for the small companies, is a problem that they do not... They, a lot of people find it very hard to change. And this entire thing about the small company, I will say I, I don't endorse at all. I used to work in a company of two, right? Uh, 20 years ago, we were one of the only people uh, 
from the people I knew who were using BIM in the early 2000s and we were back then using architectural de desktop. That meant that I could myself put out an entire model and application for planning in one week and, or less as a single person, right? And we didn't need more people to do it because it was easy to do it like that. So I, I completely kind of second what Alistair said. If you want to invest on something, invest on a pipeline that takes you from parametric uh, kind of definition and God knows every single student out of uni right now knows how to use these tools to a BIM process that can directly be used with tools that are out there like Rano Insight and a lot of plugins that can do that. You don't have to do the bespoke things that we do because let's say you have the resources and the, the need or whatever. You can actually do huge amount of things with what you already had. All you need to do is decide that you want to change. And it's easier to change a company of five than to change a company of 1800 that we are right now. So if you want to do that change, it's just a matter of like deciding, okay, hard stop. We're going to start doing things differently now. Let's rearrange our roles. Let's understand uh, if we need one or two people who know something particular, let's uh, all adhere in a new pipeline and let's go for it. So it, it's, it's not as hard as it sounds, right? Okay. Um... I think that's about all we've got time for. It's gone, it's gone really, really quickly, but um, uh, it's nice to end on a, a positive note there from Martha. I um, just want to say a big thank you to our panellists, the two Alistairs and Martha. Um, this session will be available shortly uh, on demand. I think it normally takes about 45 minutes or so for it to be, uh, to, for it to be uploaded. Um, as you leave the session, um, you'll see a feedback form come up um, please do fill that in it helps us to uh, helps us to improve our content and these sessions going forward um, we have another WA 100 live webinar at two o'clock which um, has the title developing across borders delivering the built environment in a globalized world um, I guess that's it thank you once again to the panel and goodbye